Good morning. If you would, please bow your heads with me in prayer. <coughs> Dear Lord, as we come here today to get a, a fresh word from you, we just hope that each one of us can have a thankful heart as we start into this Thanksgiving season. Lord, we are so thankful for your love, your forgiveness, your peace, and Lord, we just ask you to enter here with your spirit and help each one of us to get a fresh portion of your love and warmth and be with everything that happens in this service today. For we ask it in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> If you would please stand if you're not already. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So good to see you. Uh, praise the Lord this morning. We are thankful and we sing songs about thankfulness and uh, blessings coming from you, Lord. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father. That's James 1 to 17.
Ebenezer Street is very important. This is the Ebenezer Stone. And uh, it talks about it in 1 Samuel 7 12. A stone commemorating God's deliverance of his people. And literally, a stone of help. And I'm sure that those folks were thankful on that day of being saved by their Lord and their Lord. So we say it again about Father God. No. 
Only 55 out of those 101 people who landed at Plymouth Rock lived to see the spring. Those first pilgrims suffered greatly, but they also had a great attitude. Our forefathers were godly and sincerely uh, thankful to God for the little bit they had. They understood that to have nothing but God was reason enough to be thankful. And so on that first uh, year, in that first year, they gathered together when the harvest came in to give thanks. Much has changed in America since the landing of the Mayflower. With little, the pilgrims were thankful to God. Now with an unlimited amount of food and what would be an unimaginable amount of possessions, many suffer from an attitude of ingratitude. And I don't want to be a part of that group. I'm so blessed. America suffers from a loss of God. Many of us have watched as America has moved away from dependence upon God. And in these last years of my life, I've sought to have more dependence upon God. Our wages are up. None here are suffering from starvation. In fact, most of those who would call themselves poor today have many of the modern day conveniences. However, with, move, with the move away from God, our country suffers. I'm not trying to be negative because I think we have a great future ahead of us. And God wants to bless us. Our suffering is not due to malnutrition. It's due to a, a leanness in, in spirituality. Toward the end of their first winter, a meal time, at a meal time, the, the pilgrims were given five grains of corn to eat. That's, they were being rationed. That's all they received for a meal. And for years after that first Thanksgiving, they would start that meal with five grains of corn, and they would give five reasons, each one at the table, why what they were thankful for. Well... All three girls and their families are coming to our house this year. Uh, we're excited about that. All four of our grandchildren, Joshua and Jackson and Evie and Avon, they're coming. And, and what a time we're having. Uh, my prayer is that God will help us to have my prayer is that God will help us in these, this is our last Thanksgiving. It's our last Thanksgiving in the home we're living in. And my prayer is that God will help us, prepare us to do the things that we need to do as a church. To let people know we love God, we love them, and we want them to be a part of our church family. And so I'm praying that God will help me stay focused on that, that I'll be focused on the things that I need to be focused on to lead this church into the future and, and being fruit, fruitful in that process. It would be far better to die without food than to die without God. Amen. In four days, most of us will be celebrating Thanksgiving in our home. And I'm pretty sure the tables are going to be, well, they're going to hold plenty of food. And uh, some of you will have that cranberry uh, <coughs> stuff that you look forward so much to for Christmas. <laughs> Not me, though. <laughs> Not me, but there'll be turkey, there'll be mashed potatoes. There'll be all kinds of things that uh, a diabetic will be able to say, hey, it's Thanksgiving. 
We have reasons to be thankful. We have Jesus. I'm thankful for a lot of things, but continually I remind myself that I need to be more thankful for Jesus than anything else in my life. What a change. What, what a miracle. Uh, has taken place in my life, in Susan's life, in our home, because of Jesus. So this morning, I would like to list five things that I'm thankful for, five reasons to be thankful. The first one, I'm thankful that God created mankind, that he loves us more than any other of his creations. Amen. We we're special. God made us in his image. He did everything for us and there's nothing he wouldn't do for us. After six days of creating all things for us, God created us. He created man and people get all hung up about the days I don't. I think that probably uh, and, and, and those six days could have taken millions or billions of years. I don't know. But I know that God created everything. I believe God's word. And when he was done, he created us. And he said it was good. He's loved us. He's been faithful. It says in Genesis 1.27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. We are different than animals, people. We're, we're above the animals. Verse 26, we are over the fish, we're over the birds of the air, we're over the livestock, over all the earth, and all creatures that move on the earth. If people want to act like apes and say they want to be that they came from apes. They have the right to do so. But I know that I didn't. Amen. I know that I came from God. Amen. And that God is the creator of all. But we're different. We were created to be different. Because we were created in God's image. We're to be different than the animals. And all the other things that God created. Without Christ we, we're worse than animals. And that's why we're seeing some of the things that we're seeing happening today. When, when people are without God, they're capable of doing things that even animals aren't capable of doing. Not long after God created Adam and Eve, uh, Adam's race, we disobeyed God and we tried to be our own God. And, and what's going on in many cases today, people are still being their own God and trying to be their own God. Mankind has been trying to be his own God ever since Adam and Eve. That leads me to the second reason that I'm thankful. I'm thankful that when man chose to sin against God, that God had already chosen to love man content. Amen. Thank the Lord. Amen. His love for us has been and is unconditional. Our history is one of continual rebellion and sin. His history has been one of continual love and forgiveness. Yes, there's been punishments, but there's always been forgiveness. The patriarchs, the prophets, the kings, and even Jesus, man persecuted and killed them all. Surely they will not persecute and kill my son. But they did. They took his life. We killed him and claimed ownership of his vineyard. This is his vineyard. With the sins we are guilty of, it, it, only by God's grace and mercy. Aren't you thankful for God's grace and mercy in your personal lives? Amen. I am. It is his vineyard, yet many do not recognize him. Many do not serve him. God gave to us the right to choose whom we will serve. 
That's the only way that we can truly love Him is have the right not to. And uh, many have chosen that. However, God's Word is clear. Everyone, including you and I, one day will stand before a holy God and give account of our lives. That's something we're not hearing much about today. It will be with much brokenness if Jesus has to say to anyone of you, I'm sorry, I don't know you. Depart from me. Number three, I'm especially thankful that hell was created for the devil and not for you and I. It wasn't created for us. Hell was never intended for us. It was created for Satan. A war was fought, Lucifer versus Jesus. And that battle was won by Jesus Christ. And I believe the book. And if you look at the end of the book, he wins. Amen. Steve, Satan was cast out of heaven to earth. Now the battle is being fought again. And that battle is being fought for you and I. And Jesus has done and continues to do everything within his realms to save us. And the enemy is doing everything he can do to fight against God that we would be lost. But that's not talked about today. But there really is a heaven to gain. And there really is a hell to shun. And we hear a lot about heaven. Everybody's going to heaven. We don't hear a lot about that other place. Uh, it's called the bottomless pit. You know, I've used this illustration before, but uh, if you take a ball and you spin that ball around, Doug, where's the bottom of a ball? Well, one day, he's going to be locked up in the bottomless pit. And it's going to be over. Yes, there'll be a thousand year reign for those who uh, are around at that time and then he'll be loose for a short season. But Jesus wins and I'm thankful to be on the winning side. Amen. We win in Jesus. Amen. All the powers of hell cannot keep a Christ-like person out of heaven. Right. However, all the powers of heaven will not be able to keep a practicing sinner out of hell. People really will be lost. And there really will be those who are saved. There's no other way to heaven except for the door. Jesus is the door. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many travel that road. Narrow is the gate and straight is the way that leads to eternal life. And I would reluctantly say few there will be that find it. I want to be a part of that few and I want everyone that I know and everyone I come across to be a part of that few. It takes more than confession with the tongue. It takes the giving of your heart which means the giving of your life. After all he's done for us, it's only reasonable that we live our lives for him. Amen. Amen. Without lordship, I believe it takes lordship. Amen. The devil promotes modernism. Not everything modernism is wrong, but modernism denies that man is born in sin. Modernism denies the deity of Christ. Modernism denies the blood atonement, that the blood of Jesus Christ covers sin and cleanses from sin. Modernism denies creationism and the fall of man. Modernism denies the fact of a literal judgment and a literal hell. Jesus wants you to know that hell is a real place of torment.
You know, it's considered negative today to speak of this place called hell. But Jesus, he spoke about hell way more than he spoke about heaven. It's a real place. Uh, it's an everlasting home for some. The rich man cried out in hell immediately after his, his death and said, I'm tormented in this land. The rich man was not simply in the grave. His body may have been in the grave, but his spirit, his soul, the real him, housed in that temporary body uh, called the flesh, was still alive. He said, please send someone, me perhaps, to warn my brothers, lest they come to this place of torment. He wasn't too concerned about his brothers until he found himself in that actual place that we call hell. And immediately, I mean immediately, he thought of his brothers and he did not want them to go to this place of, of torment. Repentance will not keep you from the grave. It will, however, keep you from the bottomless pit, that place that Jesus called the lake of fire. Jesus spoke about hell as a place where the worm died not and the fire is not quenched. Somebody's saying, tell me he's not going there. Tell me he's not going there on Thanksgiving Sunday. Oh, I'm thankful I don't have to go there. I'm thankful we don't have to go there. I'm thankful that it wasn't a place that was created for us. Mark said we're told also that hell was a lake of fire uh, burning with brimstone. Uh, that, uh, I mean, that was the, John said that in Revelation 19, I believe. The smoke in Revelation 14, 11 of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night to worship the beast in his image. And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name, they say... Nobody preaches on hell today. No, it's not my favorite thing to talk about either. The scriptures about hell are so definite that any man who says hell is the grave is either an ignoramus or he's just a deliberate deceiver. Jesus preached about hell more than anyone. He urged men to flee from the wrath to come. To him, hell was a fact. He talked about going there. He talked about the victory that was won there. So horrible that he left heaven. He became a man. It was his plan all along, the God man. To live and die for our sins so that we would not have to go there. People, that is reason to be thankful. Amen. Amen. Eve was told you will not die if you eat the apple. Sin will not be punished. She died spiritually immediately. Because she did, she hid from God. And God came in the cool of the evening looking and Adam, Eve, where are you? They were hiding. God said, did you eat of the forbidden fruit? And we all know the story. Uh, go with Jesus. He never intended for us to suffer in a place like that. It's a place. The rich man knew that he was not simply in some spiritual state. He wanted his brothers warned. There, there will be no stop-offs between heaven and hell. We hear about these stop-offs today. If you've denied, if you've rejected, there'll be no stop-off. If you're going to get right with God, you, you need to get right with God now. Amen. This word says today is the day of salvation. Lazarus died and immediately was carried by the angels to, to paradise, immediately it says, and found himself uh, there uh, with Abraham. There was no delay, there was no soul sleeping, there was no 
a probation period for Lazarus. He went immediately to be with, with Jesus. <coughs> the rich man died. And he was buried. No evidence here of any delay in punishment. Notice that the torment of the rich man mentioned here took place during the lifetime of his brothers. His brothers were still alive. Wasn't in the distant future. When you're lost, you go immediately to the place that you've chosen to be. <coughs> Nothing was mentioned about getting out for good behavior. <coughs> and by the way, there's nothing mentioned in God's word about you going to heaven because of good behavior. We're all born in sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And even today, my prayer is every day, is, oh God, help me to be like you, Jesus. And forgive me when I haven't been like you, Jesus. But I know he lives within my heart because I'm always seeking to be like him. I'm always seeking to live righteously. There will be no leaving for those who, who go there. I'm thankful that God provided a way for man to deal with sin. Forgiveness and atonement through the blood of Jesus Christ. When he looks at me, God does not see my past sins. When he looks at you, he does not see your past sins. Amen. He sees the blood of Christ. Yes. <coughs> One day, I believe that Satan will try to accuse us of our sins. <coughs> and Jesus will open his book and he'll say, not guilty. I do not see such a sin in this book. I'm thankful for that link that Jesus says when you're forgiven and you confess those sins that they're thrown into that sea of forgiveness never to be remembered again. That's reason to be thankful. Amen. I've been born twice, but thank God I only have to die once. By the grace of God, I'll serve him obediently to the end where there will be no second death for me. And oh God help me. To hold to that. To hang on to that grace. Hang on to that mercy. Hang on to that faith and that hope. That I have in Jesus. And I'm thankful that Jesus paid the penalty. For my sin and your sin. And it was a penalty that I couldn't pay. That no one could pay. But he paid that ransom. And he paid it in full and the bill has been paid. The slate has been wiped clean and through Jesus Christ. Amen. He paid it all. You and I will never have to suffer in the pit. We'll never have to suffer the torment. He paid that price for us. Then I'm thankful for the resurrection of Jesus Christ by God the Father. I have that hope. I believe when he said, I must go away. I'll not leave you alone, though, but I'm coming back. And if it were not so, I would have told you so. He's coming back for us. Amen. Just like he was resurrected, we will be resurrected. I don't have a problem with that. I believe it. God's word said it. And he's done so many things and fulfilled so many prophecies and been so real to me personally. I know he's coming back. Yeah, Thankful for life itself. The only person that I've had problem believing in sometimes was myself. What a miracle. I'm thankful. I've said this all my life. I'm thankful there wasn't legalized abortion in 1954 because 
My mom had me just before her 18th birthday out of wedlock. I want you to know, though, I love my mother and I had a good mother. Later in life, I had the privilege of leading my mother to salvation through Jesus Christ. She lived in a home with ten siblings. <coughs> And if I've ever known anybody in my life, can I say they were poor? It was my mother. And some of a couple of you here, you knew her. Ten brothers and sisters. Well, not ten sisters and ten brothers, but ten siblings. <laughs> the old house they lived in wasn't very much. At one time they had a house that was pretty nice, but my grandfather lost it in a poker game. And the house that they were living in when I knew my grandmother was a house that was in one of the oldest children's name so that that house could not be lost in a poker game. My grandmother, Glenda, in my eyes, was a saint. You see, my mom's dad also had a drinking problem. There was drinking problems on both sides of my family. Now, I've never been a pastor that said if you drank a drink, you were, you were going to hell. I've never believed that. But because of my past, because of what I saw and what I experienced, I'm, I'm not a fan. <laughs> not a fan. And for me, I believe my witness is better without that because I've seen the damage, I've seen the hurt, I've seen the problems that comes from it. I understand that there's people that have a drink of wine with a meal. I'm fine with that. I'm not referring to that. I'm not going to do that, but I'm not going to look down on anybody that does. What am I saying? I'm saying that a miracle happened in my life when I was 21 years old. And that miracle was Jesus Christ coming from a very dysfunctional family, being the middle child of that family. A big change. I mean, a change that was so big that I was more impressed by that change than anybody around me. My life changed. I know what Paul meant when he said, for me to live is Jesus Christ. You've heard me say this. When, when God said, you bring what you have and you put it on the altar and I'll bring what I have and I'll put it on the altar. That's the best deal anybody ever offered me. Because I didn't check and I didn't see where I had her. Uh, everything I had to put on that altar was stuff that I needed to get rid of. And everything that Jesus had there, that was stuff that I needed. And what a change. As I said, it's my last time, but I, I want you to know that, that God can come into broken homes, to dysfunctional homes, homes that, that are, are not living for God, and through one person in that home, he can make a difference. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. My dad came to salvation at about 55 years of age. He attended here. And I watched him. I watched him times where he was so sick he could hardly hold his head up, get in his car, and go to the hospital, or go to the nursing homes and minister in the name of Jesus Christ. I wrote him a letter. He said, Dad, you, you have no idea what this means to people. And uh, I just esteemed him a little bit. And I never knew it meant that much to him, but when he died, Helen brought that letter. She showed it to me, how much it meant. See, because of Jesus in my life, my mom was saved. 
My dad was saved. My brother's now in. My sister sitting in this sanctuary, she found Jesus. Our family's dead. I am thankful. Thank God that even now as I speak, God is preparing and building a place for me in heaven. <laughs> He's building a place for everybody that knows him in a personal way. I want every one of you to be. God help us to pull together and work together and do everything we can have. My desire now is just, as I pray for years, is to be able to leave here knowing that I've finished strong, that I've been faithful. God help us. I know this is different. I know it's personal. I know it's getting late. But we have what this world needs. We have what this country needs. And we can make a difference. Amen. Prayer makes a difference. Prayer pulls on people. Prayer convicts people. Prayer puts some validity in you when you talk to people. They sense. And it becomes a spiritual issue. There's people to be won. And God help us to do everything we can do to win everybody we can win. Come on, Bob. Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, and he did, I will come again. He's already come once. And receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Let's all stand the altars of the